Okay. Yeah. This is Thursday, July 25th, 2019. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Thomas Dayhill. Welcome, Thomas. Uh, thank you. May I ask when you were born? Yeah, uh, June 22nd, 1925. And where were you born? In the great city of Cambridge. And I stood there for about six months, and then we moved to Arlington, where I uh, was in residence for the rest of my life. <clears throat> and your marital status? Single. Do you have children? Uh, I, I have a, a, a sharp answer, but I won't answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, I have no, no, no uh, children that I know of. Okay. I think that's the best way to say it. All righty. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about, now I understand you went to Arlington when you were six months old. Yeah. Tell us about life in Arlington. Like what did your father do for a living? Well, he was a, a brick mason to begin with. And uh, he actually went to Burdett College and became a, a bookkeeper. <clears throat> And uh, uh, we moved into a two-family house. He bought the house uh, in 1928, uh, uh, 29. And uh, he shifted back into uh, brick masonry because it was, uh, the pay was higher. Uh, in fact, I have no idea how much a bookkeeper uh, got paid at that time. But I'm quite sure it was something like 20 or $25 a, a week. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I may be wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, then uh, that fall, of course, 1929, uh, the bottom dropped out of everything, and it didn't make any difference what. And, uh, but what he what he did, uh, he was highly skilled in in uh, building skills. My grandfather was a builder, and uh, built uh, one house after the other. This is what he did uh, almost all his life. Uh, among other things, he ran a farm for short while. Well, my, my father was on the farm. We, uh, never finished high school because of it. <clears throat> but um, uh, my father took a, a, a test for a, uh, uh, the chief, uh, for the inspector, a building inspector in the city of Boston. And he rose to become the head building inspector of uh, Boston. So, uh, and very dignified, in fact, at his, uh, at his funeral. Uh, he was 82. Uh, he, uh, the, uh, the people who came to give tri tribute to him uh, went down the street and around the block from the, it was, it was uh, quite, quite a uh, respectful show. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I beg your pardon? Brothers or sisters? Yes, two sisters and two brothers. And I'm uh, second. Okay, I'm you're number second. two. I'm the, uh, <clears throat> I've always thought of the second child as being the observer, and then I ended up being a navigator <laughs> who is called the observer. <laughs> so it sort of fitted. And I've noticed uh, when I've seen children who are the second children, they're the quiet ones watching the older one, who is usually the one running around and, and uh, uh, performing very egotistically. <laughs> that was my sister. And she was the first grandchild. She was. She was number one in several categories. <laughs> now, before the interview, Thomas, you were telling us about what life was like during the uh, Great Depression. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, we suffered. I mean, uh, uh, we were affected by the Depression. Uh, it was difficult to even get food. Uh, in fact, we had uh, cans of, of, uh, of bully beef and that kind of stuff on occasion that was given away at the town hall. Uh, my father would go out and uh, uh, do whatever he could do for $10 a day. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was not good. Uh, however, in, re in retrospect, um, we, we never lost dignity during it. In other words, I, I would never call us a poor family or family. We, we were, uh, there are plenty of people in the neighborhood who were in the same condition and uh, we could always tell uh, which houses were sold by the bank because they were painted new. <laughs> all, the, all the ones needing paint <laughs> uh, were, were the ones that they were being painted that we were paying for the food on the table. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was a struggle for my mother and father, very much so. 
but as kids, uh, we we were treated we were treated well. Uh, good parents, very good parents, and uh, I'd say that for the rest of the people on say the street we're living on, too, and the kids were properly dressed, uh, never expensively dressed, but but uh, uh, adequately dressed for for the weather, <clears throat> and. Uh, and uh, I was beginning to tell you that uh, I was ill as a child, and uh, I saw doctors, and, uh, and, and doctors, <laughs> I, uh, I have the suspicion that uh, some people paid them off in rather strange currency. <laughs> uh, but the doctors would, would make house calls, <clears throat> and they, uh, they were on the telephone all the time. Anytime there was a problem, call them, they would give a reaction, mm -hmm. so. And our doctor was Dr. Buckley. Uh, in East Island, on Broadway in Arlington, and uh, he, uh, I think he died of diabetes, as a matter of fact. So. And you told me before the interview that as a child you were diagnosed with rheumatic fever. Yes, yeah. And uh, it, um, <clears throat> when uh, I was a senior in high school, because and this is appropriate to this interview, mm -hmm. uh, like most of the uh, uh, the men in the high school. Uh, uh, we went out and went to all the agencies to find out what we could do, what, what part of the service we'd get into, which was not the Army, because we wanted to, and we shouldn't use the phrase, but avoid the draft. <laughs> now, we're going to be drafted. There's no question about it. And uh, <clears throat> our alternative was some place that we could volunteer uh, mm -hmm. to. And uh, so uh, I went into the Army Air Corps and uh, asked, uh, went in and uh, took the, uh, the, the the exam and they went to the physical exam, and before I went in, uh, my mother was all upset. She said, "Oh, my boy, my little boy is going to be going to the army, they, and the enemy is going to shoot him." And uh, <laughs> well, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, my sister said, "Don't worry about it." And I was skinny. I was 119 pounds. And but five foot six or something like that, and uh, I mean I, I was healthy. It turned out, and <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, so my sister said, "Don't worry about. They won't take you. Look at them. They won't take you." So I went in. Next thing you know, I got this telegram from the president say, "Congratulations." <laughs> and uh, however, <clears throat> I didn't tell them that I had had rheumatic fever, and uh, I was wearing glasses in high school for reading, not for regular things. And, and uh, I was on the, uh, my athletics, I was on a track team, but uh, uh, I never competed. But uh, <clears throat> uh, in other words, this, uh, I, I, was, I, I don't think I was lying. I just didn't tell them. I didn't give them any information or uh, some arguments for uh, getting rid of me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go in. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it was the flavor of the time. Uh, uh, it was a different time than, than the last few years here with the present wars that uh, one after the other were involved in. <clears throat> in. The whole country was at war and everyone was involved. Um, the, uh, I was working for uh, uh, the first national store as a, as a do anything, uh, sweeping the floor, running the cash register, uh, stocking the, uh, uh, the, the goods. And uh, <clears throat> one of the nice things about that, uh, all food was rationed. And the, uh, uh, I was able on Saturday bring home butter, sugar, cocoa. <laughs> I mean, things that, that you could not get. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was a special thing. Uh, okay. Thomas, before we continue, uh, let's kind of step back a little bit. Uh, you went to Arlington High School. Yes. Were you, uh, were you aware of things that were happening overseas during that period? Uh, <clears throat> when I was 14 years old, I um, sold newspapers on the street. So I was very aware of the front page, the headlines and things. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the images that uh, stuck with me and uh, it led me to visit Cologne Cathedral. Uh, we had these hundred plane raids over Germany, and there was a, a photograph of Cologne Cathedral, which uh, has two spires, which are filigree, stone filigree. 
and the, the photograph was of the cathedral with these filigree towers that would take almost nothing to knock them out, and with everything else around gone, and the, the cathedral is still there. So that was, that was precision bombing. So, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I followed the, uh, the movement of uh, Germany before the war started uh, in 38, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we were con very conscious of things going on. And do you remember uh, what you were doing when Pearl Harbor was bombed in 1941? You know, I, I, I can't. Um, I, I remember uh, Roosevelt's speech, mm -hmm. which is the next day, and the, the, uh, the term infamy. Uh, <clears throat> um, but I don't know exactly where I was, and we were about ready to move from the heights down into the house that my grandfather built. My, grandma, my grandmother had passed away, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, my father was, uh, he, was the, he was the oldest in the family, so uh, he built the house. And, uh, but I don't, I don't remember. Um, I remember other things when Kennedy was killed and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. But, no. You were mentioning earlier in the interview about uh, rationing. What else do you remember about um, life during wartime before you went into the Army Air Corps? Well, <clears throat> uh, there were restrictions of all sorts. Um, and as I say, the, when I was working the, in the grocery store, I was able to bring home some specialty items. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and and uh, everything was rationed. Um, there were limitations, people going into the service all the time, and, and we, were, uh, we knew when people were killed and that sort of thing. So it, it, uh, we knew that a war was going on, but being a teenager, you don't understand what death is. And I think it's one of the reasons that young people are taking, taken into the war, uh, into the armies. Um, the, uh, uh, But there, was, there were no politics. In fact, politics disappeared. Uh, I remember when Hoover ran for the presidency. You know, that was, I must, must have been about mm -hmm. six years old, and uh, uh, five or six, something like that. And uh, uh, I was wondering why the man who made the vacuum cleaner was running for president. <laughs> that's, how my, that's how wise I was. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, now there, there's, I think that politics just disappeared from from our the, the, the people I knew, and and uh, we're far more interested in going to classes. And uh, 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 so I had I was always I always had a job uh, when I was going through high school, and my courses, fortunately, uh, were uh, the the the, the uh, courses called technical courses, and they had mathematics and science primarily with. <coughs> uh, two very solid classes in art. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was a star of the art, uh, of the art course, mm -hmm. and I could do anything I wanted. And, uh, and uh, uh, the art teacher was, was very good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I remember in the senior year, uh, I met him in the, in the corridor, and he said, how is it you didn't sign up for the art course again? Because I'd taken two years in a row. And I said, I have to take physics. And he stormed down the street and said, physics, physics, physics. <laughs> but, uh, um, and I think <clears throat> uh, in the uh, senior year, uh, it was heavier on, on the technical things. Than, and I had to drop, I guess, uh, the art course was an elective. Mm -hmm. and, but what happened when I was into the service, um, uh, the uh, one, uh, I was in a program, and we went to basic training first. I don't know whether this is out of line or not, yeah. but uh, <clears throat> and we went up to Mass, uh, Mass State College in Amherst uh, for the college training detachment. It was called, and it's something like the V12 of the of the uh, Navy. Uh, and uh, I think we took over the entire campus. I I don't recall there were any other students at the campus. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we were there for three months, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, um, 
a very short time in, in basic training, and it was not, not a minute too short. I mean, too long. It was, I didn't like it. Um, and uh, we, we left, and uh, I did, I, I got through the thing. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it less, let, uh, gave me a very bad taste. Uh, first of all, anyone with a southern accent, I don't trust. And uh, because <coughs> within the first 24 hours, all of our uh, footlockers that we were given were opened up, and anything in it that was of any value, money uh, uh, or jewelry, anything like that, was stolen. And uh, so we didn't have any money until we got paid, which was uh, $18, I think, something like that. $18. They, they used to say we got $18 a day once a month. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, um, it, it was unpleasant, but uh, the going to college up in Amherst was wonderful. And, and this, uh, uh, if you'll pardon me here, this was summer of 1943, when you were in UMass, Am uh, what is now UMass Amherst. Uh, yeah, well, okay, yeah, it's, it, it, was the, it was the only state school at that mm -hmm. time. It was the Cow College, they call it, or an agricultural mm -hmm. college. Uh, and I guess uh, that they just suspended the operations and, took, and allowed the Army to take it over, uh, or the Army Air Corps to take it over. And uh, uh, we were um, uh, organized in eight sections, and the, the first section was filled with college graduates. And uh, the second section had all college graduates or people who had uh, two years or so in, in college, plus two graduates from high school. One was a fellow from uh, Springfield, and the other was me. And uh, <clears throat> so we, we felt quite privileged. And both of us went on. Uh, I don't know what the other fellow uh, became uh, later, uh, but uh, some of the ones in the first group, the first and second group, didn't make it. Uh, but it was, <clears throat> it, was, it was something brand new for me. It was, the, uh, we'd get up in the morning, uh, have breakfast, and then we'd do calisthenics, uh, which I had never done in my life. And uh, I was 119 pounds when I went in, and uh, uh, by the time uh, we were about a month up in Amherst, I was 135, <laughs> and it was muscle. <laughs> I never had muscles before, <laughs> and uh, I was healthy, and it was good, and uh, it was regular, uh, and the. The food, I can't remember what the food was, uh, but no complaints. And uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I remember several of the classes, and the, the one I like to, to tell people about is the mathematics class. We started off by counting, and then we added, and then, then we added, we went to uh, subtraction, then multiply. Multiplication and division, long division, percentages, and things like that, and then uh, we ended up in calculus in three months. And uh, I had had all of that uh, I through calculus in high school, so uh, I was I was very well prepared uh, for what was going on. And now physically, I was I was much better prepared. And uh, uh, toward the end. <coughs> uh, the, the, it was structured so that we had uh, what we thought was strenuous exercise to begin with, and it got more strenuous as we went along, but we didn't mind it. For instance, uh, we <clears throat> one, uh, I think it was a Thursday, we ran around a track uh, for time, for doing a mile in time. And, uh, and then uh, we did a, uh, 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 what they call it, an obstacle course, which is made of logs. And it was, it was a rugged course, and uh, it was fun. And, but the more you did it, the easier it was. And in other words, you're building muscles and, uh, and ability to do things that you, you couldn't do on the first day. And uh, then uh, <clears throat> on, I think it was a Friday, uh, we did, we did the, the uh, obstacle course, and then, uh, then we started doing a run, a two and a half mile run. Uh, and uh, next thing you know, we did the obstacle course and then went on the run and did the obstacle course again at the end. And every Saturday, uh, we went out and did a five-mile run, just a cross-country run, and then uh, and there was a, 
a little guy, and I remember his name, Jerry Giesler. Uh, he was shorter than I, and uh, he beat me every time. We came in number one and number two on the five mile run. And we, beat, we were so far ahead of everybody else that we were able to go into the gymnasium and dip in the pool, <laughs> swim a lap in the pool. And, uh, and then uh, we had to uh, clean up and uh, we had, uh, um, what do they call it, the, uh, we had a parade. Mm -hmm. So, and that was every Saturday. Uh, so it was, it was a mixture of, of uh, pleasure and, and uh, a very healthy preparation mm -hmm. for whatever is going to happen. Right. And, uh, uh, and then I came down with uh, uh, acute uh, bronchitis uh, just in time for, for Christmas. It was Christmas time, and I, I've forgotten whether it was before or after Christmas we left, mm -hmm. but we were scheduled to leave the group. And there's another fellow and I uh, who both came down with this stuff. Well, I did something stupid. Uh, it was, there was snow on the ground and it was, uh, 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 I was feeling robust. And I remember shaking some blankets out uh, in my bare feet you know, in the snow, 18 years old. <laughs> yeah, something is wrong upstairs. And uh, uh, I came down with this uh, thing. I got up the next morning for breakfast and I couldn't breathe, and my, this, uh, an elephant was sitting on my chest. So <clears throat> I went in, they gave us uh, codeine and turpin hydrate. I, I can say, still say it, and the codeine frightens me today, but uh, at that time, it was wonderful stuff, and put you to sleep and uh, all that. Uh, and uh, the morning that, oh, the day before we were gonna leave, there was a fried chicken brewer, uh, and uh, everyone, this, everyone was eating this fried chicken and they had beer. And uh, uh, so the window opened up, we were on the ground floor and they passed some fried chicken so we didn't have the beer. And, uh, uh, and the next morning this fellow said, we've got to get out of here. And we both had temperatures and, and we both still sick. And uh, so he, he said, no, this is what we do. And I had no, I was a little bit naive. And he said, you take the thermometer and uh, you put it in your mouth. And if it's high, you dip it in the ice water. And then if it's low, you rub it on your sleeve <laughs> and bring it up to normal. <laughs> and so anyway, we did that and, and they released us. So we, and we, uh, we, fortunately we were on these sleepers going down to Tennessee mm -hmm. where we, uh, uh, we, were, uh, we had a, a battery of tests uh, uh, both uh, something like an IQ, IQ or a, uh, uh, a standard uh, uh, college entry uh, exams. And uh, in fact, the tests that we took to get into the service, then these tests, and then the ones I took later on when I went to Tufts, uh, they're all the same format. And the one I liked best was the one that you have a paragraph to read, and then you answer all the questions down below. And <clears throat> These were all timed, and uh, some people, when they went back, they had to look up the answer, had to check it on, and of course they didn't finish the thing in time. And so the reason I left is because, uh, I, well, I, I did a lot of reading when I was in high school, and uh, as a kid, I did a lot of reading. And uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, anyway, uh, we got down to <coughs> Tennessee, uh, we were on the sleeper. Well, we were on the sleepers, and he and I both slept solidly. Although I don't know what happened to him after that, uh, but we get down there, and the, wouldn't you know, the first night, I was put on guard duty, and I had to walk around a coal tower, and uh, it was in Tallahassee. Is Tallahassee? No, that's in Florida. You said, yeah, Tennessee? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, the, uh, what, what's the capital of Tennessee? Memphis. Nashville? Frankfurt. That's Kentucky. Well, okay. <laughs> Nashville. Anyway, okay. we're there. And uh, uh, there was at the, at the, at the field, <clears throat> uh, there was a, a water tower, and it had just snowed. Well, snow in Tennessee is snow if it's a quarter of an inch, mm -hmm. but it was cold. And uh, so I went around this thing and finally I got back and they tried to wake me up for when, uh, after I had rested a while and they couldn't wake me up. 
So somebody else had to go up and finish. <laughs> but I uh, took the tests, and uh, uh, I sent a telegram home saying, qualified for pilot, because I wanted to be a pilot. Well, one of the things we did up in Amherst <clears throat> was uh, we had 10 hours of flight time. And uh, uh, we, did not, we did not solo, but we did everything but. Uh, and uh, it was great. We got up early in the morning, five or six, and went out and, uh, in the crisp air and, and uh, flew over the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was, it was a lot of fun. And we did, you know, with stalls and spins and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, uh, but I, I had my heart set on being a pilot. And, uh, but I qualified for all three, pilot, navigator, and, and bombardier. So <coughs> the, uh, I sent the telegram home. Next day, uh, a group of us were hauled in and said, this uh, fellow, an officer said, we don't need pilots. We already have the, the uh, uh, there's a backlog waiting to go into pilot training. And what happened actually was that the, uh, 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 the people who were with me uh, they went in, and they, they were going to be, say, if they didn't qualify for navigator, then uh, they went, uh, they went as pilots. And many of them ended up in the Battle of the Bulge because they just waved a wand over and said, you're in the infantry. And they needed bodies, and uh, I mean, it's horrible to say, but uh, uh, this is exactly what happened. So the next day, uh, we were told, we don't need pilots, but we do need bombardiers and navigators. and. Uh, so I said, okay, I'll be a navigator. And uh, so I went down to Selman Field, Alabama, and there's another field in uh, Louisiana. Uh, it was right next. And uh, spent the winter and the summer <laughs> in that horrible place. Uh, I never loved this. I think that uh, most people who were in the service in the, uh, in the First World War uh, went to some place in the South for training, mm -hmm. and they ended up not liking it very much. <laughs> well, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good experience for enjoying the landscape. Okay, <clears throat> Thomas, we're gonna pause a little bit, and yeah. you're, by the time you're at some, uh, in Alabama, you're about to take navigated training, yeah. what was your rank? Cadet. You're, you're still a cadet. cadet. <clears throat> and a cadet, uh, actually a cadet, uh, the pay was a little bit better than, uh, than a, uh, it's something like a PFC, mm -hmm. but it, it's not. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not the equivalent because you don't, you have no ranks, uh, and no privileges whatsoever. You're a cadet because you're in the program, and if you flunked out, you were a private. So we were literally were privates with a cadet rank. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, when uh, we graduated, uh, we were flight officers, not lieutenants. And uh, I became a lieutenant over in the South Pacific uh, in spring, I think, of uh, 45. All right, and during this time that you're in training, mm. were you, how did you, uh, how were you best made aware of what was happening in Europe and the Pacific? Was it by the radio, by I newspapers? Don't, no? mo most likely, uh, well, we had, we had uh, newspapers, mm -hmm. that is, uh, within the service, and uh, we had articles writing about one thing or another. And uh, it was all public relations, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was not news. And we could read newspapers, and, uh, but I didn't. I, I, knew, I knew what was going on, I, and I knew the in invasion of Sicily and all that sort of thing in North Africa and, and things. Uh, so maybe we were just keeping, I can't recall right. uh, thinking about it, but I'm quite sure it was part of our conversations. And uh, uh, we were also very conscious of the fact that there were strikes in the defense work for people wanting more money. And none of us were happy about that. In other words, it, there was a little bit of greed that was going on that uh, was not what we were up to. And uh, uh, it was just, a, it was a little tawdry, but, uh, mm -hmm. but as far as what was actually going on in the rest of the world, I think we, we got general information. Mm -hmm. it was, I, I think that 
there was uh, most likely some uh, restriction of information of mm -hmm. sorts, but it, it was usually done in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, they say yes. And uh, reading the, the history of 13th Air Force, uh, the way it was written, uh, my little flight that I'll tell you about uh, had some disaster associated with it and was eliminated. Wasn't even mentioned. And a little closer to Holmes, so when you were stationed in Alabama, did you see um, segregation off the base? Uh, I was brought. I was brought up in Arlington, mm -hmm. which is literally white, no blacks, mm -hmm. except for one black family that moved lived around the corner, and that man walked down the street once, and one of the little kids in the street looked at him and said, "Oh, look, there's a nigger." And the man turned around and said, shut your mouth, boy. And that was, that's the, that, that's mm -hmm. all the words and everything else, that's the total uh, experience. And uh, uh, no people of color in the school systems or, uh, or living in the town that I knew of at the time. And <clears throat> even in the service, I saw no um, Afro-Americans or people of color uh, uh, Except there's one officer, he, he came in and he took a shower when I was taking a shower. Now, he was most likely a guest of some sort, and that's all I know, is that he showed up, he took a shower, and that was it. Uh, <clears throat> and he was a good-sized guy. And, uh, uh, and then on the way back on the ship, uh, we must have had some uh, Afro-Americans or black, black people in the, uh, down in the hold. Uh, because I, one of them came up to me and said, I don't, I don't feel well, and his eyes were all bloodshot. He, he was suffering from seasickness, and uh, so I, I excused him. I was on duty mm -hmm. uh, the last couple of days, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so I excused him. But they're the only two people in the service, because it was seg complete segregation mm -hmm. in the service. Okay, Thomas, let's get you back to uh, navigation school in Alabama. Yep. How long were you down there? Well, uh, I th think, uh, I don't know, one of these sheets has, mm -hmm. I have anything here. I, I think I graduated in, in the middle of the summer. Okay. Uh, and uh, because uh, we went from there, I had a delay en route, mm -hmm. and I came home for maybe a week, and uh, it was very pleasant. And, went up to see my art teacher in <laughs> school. Not, none of the other people, but I just saw the art teacher. And I remember uh, meeting an old girlfriend and I think that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and then uh, what happened, something happened between the basic training and uh, uh, Amherst. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was not, closely associated with almost anybody. And I think because we knew each other. In fact, it's one of those situations where you knew everyone's name in the barracks, and uh, for 28 days we knew each other, and then, bammo, you, you didn't see any of those people and you had no idea what happened to them. And some of them might have been in this group, but I, I, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that affected me. And. Uh, uh, the, when I went out to uh, Lamar, California, uh, San Francisco, and then Lamar Field, uh, <clears throat> after visiting my home, I went by a change trains in, uh, uh, in Chicago. And another guy was my height and my wings. <laughs> I got on, he was a navigator, and he was going out the same place. So, we, uh, so he must have graduated from uh, the same school, but another another area, uh, uh, another uh, geographical area. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, uh, we shared uh, information and that sort of thing. Going to San Francisco, we shared a room in a in a hotel. We got to Lamore Field, California, and then uh, uh, that's when our, our that, that's that was our destination. And then we got on a plane and went to Tonopah, Nevada. And Tonopah, Nevada was where <coughs> we met uh, with our uh, crew, the crew that, uh, my crew was the one that mm -hmm. I was going to be with uh, for the, the entire time in the South Pacific. And uh, 
we were lined up the uh, maybe a day or two later uh, in one of the first flights we took. And at that time, <coughs> we were lined up. Uh, the, there would be uh, three or four uh, planes on the runway traveling down at the same time. Uh, and the purpose of that was to get a lot of plane in the air fast and get into mm -hmm. uh, squadron formation and, and uh, do something. Well, the one in front of us is where this fellow, my, my, the fellow I just met, uh, was on. And it took off, and next thing we know, there's a big flash against the, uh, uh, the hill. And uh, that was it. And I was numbed. In other words, we knew what happened, and I knew he was on that plane. And uh, um, I made sure that I never was friendly with anyone. That mm -hmm. is to the point where uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be struck. It would hurt me if, if something happened to them. And uh, I never became uh, very buddy buddy with anyone on the on the on the crew. Uh, we uh, within the first day or so, <clears throat> within the first day or so, uh, we went out uh, into the town. The town started with 80 people and spread as soon as the Air Force got there. It was 300. <laughs> Big town. Mm -hmm. It was an old mining town. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the crew, the six, the six uh, uh, enlisted men, uh, lower ranks, uh, they, uh, they said, what should we call you guys? And so and, uh, there, were, there were going to be times when we'd be relaxed and we talk to each other and uh, uh, I, we, we didn't do it too often but must have been often enough and they were very pleasant fellows and, and from what I could tell there was no problems whatsoever between any individuals uh, all the time and we were busy we we're busy doing something and uh, uh, so we decided then as so when we are in a uh, uh, in an operational situation you call us by our rank, and when we are having a beer someplace, you can call us by our first names. <laughs> and so we, we took that right away, and they asked about that, and uh, and it was fine. And and uh, when we were in training in t at Tonopah, uh, we were far more relaxed and, and uh, friendly uh, than later on when we were in combat, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was good because we got. We got to know and trust each other. And the trust, uh, I think, is extremely important. Uh, I've always thought that Star Trek, the, the original Star Trek program, uh, was successful because, well, first of all, the man who was responsible for it was in the 13th Air Force. Gene Roddenberry? Yes. Wow. And he was there, he was in the South Pacific two years before me. Uh, and I only learned that recently. <laughs> but I think the, the way the crew acted on Star Trek was reminiscent of how it should happen uh, when you're in combat. Mm -hmm. In other words, complete reliance of each. And uh, you, may, you may be familiar with uh, the individual in familiar situations, but uh, when, when you are in, when you're in the role of of, uh, of whatever it is on the crew, then you were strict. And Thomas, for the record, what were you flying? B-24? In, in uh, Tonopah, Nevada, <coughs> we're flying B-24s. In mm -hmm. other, and, and all of our training was for <coughs> uh, B-24s. And because in uh, the South Pacific, the, uh, there are two, two major bombers. One is the B-17 and one is the B-24. Well, the B-24 had a larger bomb bay and had a, a, a greater uh, range. And, uh, uh, but the B-17 had much better armament and uh, uh, it was used almost exclusively. There were some B B-24s used in Europe and particularly in Italy. And uh, uh, the B-17s were limited in their use in the South Pacific because the B-24s took over. And <clears throat> in the very beginning, the B-24 had a terrible habit of when, when you uh, uh, went in for a landing at sea, would split in half and both halves would go down right away. Mm -hmm. And they remedied that, fortunately, before I got there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the, the first death, <clears throat> the death of the fellow in Tonopah, um, 
uh, that was a practice. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, uh, and I understand <coughs> there, there were a fair number of deaths mm -hmm. in practice. And the planes were not necessarily the best planes. In other words, they, they were back from overseas, uh, and, or they were earlier models, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't know specifics about that. But we, we were trained in uh, machinery that dealt only with the B-24. And uh, I mean, I wanted to fly a pursuit plane, but I never did. <laughs> so how long were you uh, stationed in Nevada before you guys moved uh, on? It was the, the entire fall. The entire fall. Yeah, uh, I guess it was September. In fact, we had, we had Christmas in Hawaii. Uh, so uh, uh, we left uh, after, after mm -hmm. Thanksgiving or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, I, got, I got fed up with little towns that have nothing but gambling and, and uh, whatever else goes. <laughs> you know, drinking and gambling is uh, 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 what goes on in one of those little towns. And our, our bombardier, I suppose I shouldn't talk about him, but uh, uh, he, was a, he was a good bombardier. He, he was precision. And, uh, but he liked to drink <clears throat> and uh, he liked to gamble. And I remember once he said, uh, uh, every time we went gambling and I was with him, I said, I'd have a, I might have one drink, but I, was, I didn't drink it at, mm -hmm. at the time at all uh, or sell them. And uh, I can't remember having a drink uh, in Tonopah. Uh, the, uh, he said, uh, oh, he used to win. First he played with the wheel and then he'd go to the dice tables and he'd win. And he'd end up with several hundred dollars. And uh, he said, oh, once I was with him and he said, now I want you to take my winnings and go back to the room and no matter how I plead, don't give me my money back. And so I went back, and he stayed there. Well, you know what happened. He lost his money, and he came back and said, give me my money. And of course I did. And I said, but never ask me to do this again. And that was it. But uh, it was one of his weaknesses, and drinking was also. Uh, when we were in the South Pacific, <clears throat> at the end of a mission, uh, we were given a shot of whiskey. And uh, uh, today I can understand it in a certain situ situation when uh, I'm quite sure it would calm you down or relax you. And then we went in for a debriefing <clears throat> after that. But uh, the two pilots and I did not drink. And uh, so we got credit for our shots. And as soon as we got, let's say, 20 shots in a bottle, we got credit for a bottle. And then uh, when we got up to, well, we want to keep the chronology right, but when we finally got up to uh, Philippines, it was in the rainy season, and uh, we had a tent that was only half there, and it was, it was miserable. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time we got finished, by the time September came along when I left, we had a platform, uh, we had screens all around, uh, we had a, a, um, a, a parachute inside which kept some dead air up there and insulators from heat. <coughs> we had a very pleasant, little dwelling. <laughs> and, and that was all because mm -hmm. we had the, the bottles of booze that we'd, ta we'd take them down to the uh, uh, CVs mm -hmm. and get, get building materials. Ah. They mm -hmm. didn't have any, they, they had no way of getting a hold of alcohol. And our alcohol was good stuff, it came from Australia. Because every once in a while we'd send, we'd send a, what was called a fat cat, uh, a stripped down uh, B-24 that uh, and they just filled the, the mm -hmm. central section, the, the bomb bays or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, with booze and uh, mm -hmm. keep our supply going. Okay, so let's yep. step back again a yep. little bit. You spent Christmas in Hawaii. Yep. And then where were you, where was your next duty station? We went from the two places we did it uh, that I remember was, first it was at Christmas Island. Mm -hmm. And I remember it because when we went onto the, uh, onto the beach area, we were told we had to wear our boots because there were crabs all over the place and these crabs would snap at you and take off a toe. So we had to wear them. But, but there was a, a, a lagoon and I remember swimming in the, in the lagoon. And uh, it was just one of those situations of 
great pleasure. And the water was lovely and it was clear, <laughs> clean. And, uh, uh, and uh, Christmas Island is tiny. It's just big enough for the airstrip. And uh, then we went from there to Canton, which has one tree on it. And I, there was a story about somebody, some fellow, they used to decorate the tree <coughs> at Christmas time, and some fellow went up and was about to cut it down, <laughs> and they caught him in time. But anyway, uh, so, uh, uh, but we, and uh, Guadal I think Guadalcanal, we mm -hmm. stopped in, we finally, I think we stopped at four different places on the way and <clears throat> ended up in Leyi, which is the easternmost part of New Guinea. And uh, then we went there uh, to what's a, a little town right next to it, it's called Nazab, and it was a replacement depot. Mm -hmm. It's not on there. Mm -hmm. No, it's further south. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's, that's only one, one of the mm -hmm. missions. And uh, I was gonna bring a whole map, but mm -hmm. uh, I didn't. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we were there for, I guess, a week or so. I sh we were there mm -hmm. from February 9th to February 14th. Mm -hmm. Ooh, so it must have, we, we were going across, we stayed in, uh, we were in uh, 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 Hawaii for Christmas. And then uh, we stayed in a hotel, I've forgotten whether it's the Royal Hawaiian or, or another. And uh, at that time, there was no other hotel on Waikiki Beach. Now you, you it's just it's jam packed with hotels. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, but so we must have been there for uh, a, a fair amount of time waiting uh, for our transportation. And we were transported. We were, it was a transporter, two, two engine plane that uh, uh, took us across. And uh, uh, so this says, Nazab says, Treasure, said, February 9th, so we arrived early in February 9th, and maybe, maybe the 1st of February, I don't know. Uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, we, training of different kinds. We were trained in, there was a, a uh, long range navigation system, which is in place in, in uh, the South Pacific, but we never had equipment in the planes for it. It's called Loran, long range. And, uh, so I was expert in fact, they asked, they asked me to come in after I took the course. And uh, uh, so I went in, they said, uh, how would you like to uh, skip all that nonsense of, of joining the Air Force and, and come here and be an instructor? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and uh, also uh, while I was there, I, I wrote it down here. Um, uh, I got malaria, and uh, uh, it's not on my record, but uh, I got malaria, and next thing I know, I was in overnight, and uh, they just dosed me with Adiprin, which was the, the uh, medicine of a choice at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, I turned bright yellow and remained bright yellow. It was called an Adiprin tan. <laughs> anyway, I stayed I was bright yellow for the rest of my time there. And, uh, uh, but I, um, and it, the, the symptoms uh, went away, or mm -hmm. at least I was able to function without trouble. Um, and that's the only medical thing other than acute bronchitis I had. Mm -hmm. Now, Thomas, yeah. at the time you arrived in that uh, specific theater, uh, what was your rank? I was a, a flight officer. You're still a flight <clears throat> officer. Yep. I had, we had blue, uh, instead of a gold bar, we had blue bar. And uh, <clears throat> it's like a chief petty officer or something like that. Okay. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think they did it because there were so many lieutenants and, and uh, they had to do something. Mm -hmm. Same rank, I mean, same, same uh, uh, pay. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we get $75 a, year, a week, I mean a month. <laughs> well, at least you had money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, what did we do? Oh, we had... Uh, yeah, seventy-five mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, anyway, and I had most of it sent home, uh, which has made sense. Uh, and, and some guys, uh, mm -hmm. they spent it. I don't know. I don't know what they spent it on because mm -hmm. there's nothing. I mean, we used in uh, when we were in the Philippines, we used uh, invasion money, which isn't worth anything. And 
Uh, we used to pay uh, the Filipinos who did some work for mm -hmm. us around the place, uh, pay them in uh, invasion money. And uh, we, we got so much, and it was, uh, it, it was, it was worth money at the time, and, uh, and it, but they didn't want to have dollars floating around mm -hmm. and having somebody had a big cash of dollars over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't understand the economy yeah. anyway. So. so by the time you arrived, the Philippines were in the process of being liberated, or were they or it, already? They were, uh, there was fighting going on all over. I see. In fact, I, uh, uh, Luzon, uh, Manila, was still under uh, Japanese uh, uh, hands, and uh, uh, most of the islands were. And Samar and, and Palawan, they, uh, they were yeah, Samar right over there, mm -hmm. Samar over here, okay. and Palawan Island, uh, at least parts of them, uh, were occupied by us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we worked out of. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, but in, uh, down in uh, New Guinea is, is where we became a little bit more familiar with what's going to go on. And it was still, uh, I was 19. And uh, I think the reason that they have kids going over is because they have no idea uh, how horrendous war is. And we're in the Air Force, which means that we were up in the air and we had no, uh, we could have uh, if we fell down someplace. Uh, but we had no hand-to-hand -hand combat. We did not see the enemy. Uh, we saw their machinery, and uh, and we and, and uh, uh, we bombed uh, refineries, say in in Bonio, and uh, we flew th through the smoke. But mm -hmm. uh, we did not see bodies of the of uh, uh, of the Japanese. Okay. And uh, um, we heard stories. And uh, uh, one we while we were in New Guinea, there was a fellow who was shot down, he was, a, uh, he was a member of a crew, and he was shot down on the west coast of Borneo, and he went through Borneo from one side to the other uh, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Moros, I think, uh, uh, the natives, uh, and he went from tribe to tribe, and he just talked to them, and I don't know what language he spoke, <laughs> but he was from, from New York or Brooklyn or someplace like that, and he had an accent. Uh, and uh, 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 he just made his way. He, it, well, he said that uh, 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 he was given the daughter of the chiefs uh, to all these different places. Yeah, and of course, we didn't know what to believe him or not. But, but he, was, he told a good story. And, but to go from one side of that country, which was wild, mm -hmm. and these, these are, they're, they're, they're not considered civilized people, even today, I think, there's a question. And uh, uh, the, uh, anyway, uh, we got a dose of that. We went into the jungles with uh, naturalists who, I, I know what a passion fruit looks like now. And we had hearts of palm. And when I was told what they did to get the hearts of palm, I said, you mean you take that beautiful palm tree and break it down just for a foot up there, the delicate, and that's what they do. And that's what hearts of palms are. And uh, anyway, we had, that was in the training, so this is maybe a week or so, and uh, uh, so we had lessons of different kinds. And uh, Then uh, we had our first mission, and the first mission was on February 13th. And there was a, a, uh, uh, a city on the northern coast, about halfway across the northern coast, and I always think of New Guinea as looking like a, um, a Gila monster, something with a head on the one end, and he's got a neck here, and then his back up here. Well, in the middle of the back is a little town called Wewak, and the Japanese controlled it. And uh, uh, we were told that <clears throat> uh, there was a large group of people there, and they had an air airfield, and uh, uh, they also had farms. And uh, what they would do is wait until the farms are ready for harvest, and drop napalm or some whatever they used at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they would burn the drops, and uh, I don't think it was napalm at that time. Uh, it was like a gasoline. And, uh, uh, and also the airfield, as soon as it was in fairly good shape, uh, they would bomb it. And we went in, and we were in a, I don't know how many planes in the, whether it's just a squadron or what, but uh, uh, we flew in formation uh, over it, uh, over the 
airfield and drop the bombs on the airfield. And uh, um, that was the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, my job <coughs> was to, to navigate. Uh, and uh, when we went over the, uh, I would give the bombardier information of air, air speed, ground speed, uh, and, the, and the, the wind speed. And then I would go to the Bombay and look down. Well, I was told, and uh, the, 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 these people who say, oh, you're going, you're going to go on your first flight. Oh, well, um, don't forget to wear your flak suit, because there was a lot of anti-aircraft. And then the last thing the fellow said who gave me advice was, where's the flak coming from? And I said, down there. I said, yes. Well, they tell you to put the flak suit up in the front and the back. Well, when you're sitting <laughs> down, the flak is coming up. So I put the flak suit down and leaned on it so that it was just in case anything happened. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but that was good advice. Uh, <clears throat> but my job was to observe the bombs. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up by uh, calling it 80%. And almost every time I called 80%. There's always something that went over the edge and the, and the bomb path uh, was... Uh, 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 right down the line. And it was good. Yeah, we, we, we pretty much clubbed the area. But the anti-aircraft was heavy. And that was when I called the pilot and I said, navigator the pilot, I see some little puffs of smoke and they're getting bigger. And I've forgotten whether he actually, I, he was a re religious man, so I, I don't know whether he said, oh my God. But well, I, when I wrote the story, I said, he said, oh my God, they're shooting at us. And then all I could see was blue sky, so he, he broke out of formation. And uh, uh, so I crawled back. Uh, I had oxygen. Uh, we were at 20,000 feet. I crawled back to my desk. And we were told in navigation school that there were certain situations which, which take place. One of those was when uh, the pilot flies all over the sky and then very quietly asks you for a direction home. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so I get back to my desk, and I was trying to figure out where we were, and he asked for a direction. So I gave him a direction. And they said, tell him anything, just to get him going the right direction, then work like a son of a gun and, and get an answer for him. And that's what I did. Uh, so, uh, so that was a, it made it a, a very interesting first mission. Um, we were shot at, uh, we broke, uh, we went to uh, evasive, uh, uh, maneuvers, and, uh, uh, and my a little lesson in navigation sc uh, school paid off. Uh, then uh, uh, we landed, and uh, there's a photograph and, uh, we have of after the first mission. And there are two photographs I like to compare when I'm, if I'm showing something to somebody. One was just after we arrived, or when we were either in Hawaii or on, on Canton, or one of those places. Um, and uh, we were a happy bunch. And in fact, I think at one, one time I took a photograph and then uh, I stood uh, I stood up in, in front with a uh, <laughs> mugging the camera. Or something. And it, but the photograph after the first, we were, uh, we were in combat for the first time. And we didn't know what was going on. But uh, we realized that this was not happy time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they shot at us, and uh, they're nasty, those guys. Mm -hmm. They're going to shoot us. <laughs> so then the second mission the next day mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> was to, to uh, uh, bomb Rabal, which was giving uh, a lot of uh, shipping and uh, uh, other areas uh, a bad mm -hmm. time. And uh, it is not on there. Okay. Nope. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's much further south and to the okay. east, mm -hmm. east. And mm -hmm. it was heavily fortified, and uh, it was called a hotspot, and, uh, and it had a terrible reputation. And we lost a lot of planes over it. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> we rolled down the runway, and uh, just as we were taking off, just the, pl the wheels were leaving the ground, uh, the, the pilot feathered the right, uh, the, uh, one of the right uh, engines, and it began to just windmill. Uh, and uh, he said the the prop governor ran away. I mean, it's 
I, I didn't understand what that meant, but I, I just understood that uh, it was uh, uh, it was functioning in, improperly. Mm -hmm. So he cut the one engine, and then we dropped the bombs. Uh, and I've never known whether the bombs went off and we were shunt, uh, blown up, you know, higher, or whether it was just the release of the bombs that uh, allowed mm -hmm. us to go up, and which most likely was the truth. Mm -hmm. And he circled around and uh, uh, to land again because we weren't going anyplace on three engines. And then, as we lined up to, to come down on the field, uh, a second engine uh, had to be feathered. So we lost two engines, and then we landed with two engines, and then uh, we wheeled down to the end of the runway and made a right turn, and just as we were <laughs> going toward the, uh, the dock where, where we were going to uh, leave the plane, a third engine went out. So we lost three engines on the second and when I when I wrote that little story for my my friend uh, Edwin Taylor, uh, uh, <clears throat> I had to look up to find out which one was first because I, I thought maybe the first one was the mm -hmm. <coughs> Rabaul one, but it was it was the second. And uh, I think I have it. Here. Yeah, it says Nazab, February fourteenth. Yeah, in fact, one day after the other. Fe mm -hmm. February thirteenth was uh, the WeWAC one, and uh, the fourteenth. Uh, was Rabal, and it just says abort. Oh, and it wasn't called the second one because we bought it. So the second one was the second one was when we bombed air, re, air uh, oil refinery mm -hmm. uh, in Borneo. That was a long flight, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the uh, the interesting thing about that one was that we're twenty thousand feet. <coughs> and the, um, excuse me, the, uh, uh, the black clouds coming up from the air, mm -hmm. uh, from the oil refinery was higher than we were. Uh, and uh, I noticed there was a plane, a uh, Japanese plane, mm -hmm. uh, off to the right. Uh, and uh, it was flying our speed in our direction. And uh, I mentioned that. and. Uh, uh, the reaction was that, oh, they're just checking to see where we're going, so what else is, what are they doing? Then there's another Japanese plane that circled around up here, and then it dive-bombed on us and dropped phosphorus bombs. They were bombing us, they were bombing the bombers. <laughs> well, we were, at that time, we, a B-24 uh, was um, before the B-19 and B-29 mm -hmm. came into being. Um, the uh, B-24 was the largest bomber uh, uh, in the service, so, uh, and it, it did carry uh, a greater payload and uh, uh, had a greater range. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, so the Japanese didn't have anything big enough, or at least that size, mm -hmm. and uh, so what do you do? You, you bombed it, and, <laughs> and that's what they were doing. And I just looked at it, and again, uh, 19 years old, uh, Zero fear. I had. I had no. I was concerned at times, but I had no fear, and uh, nothing e even close to panicking uh, ever. And uh, uh, I think just being that age. And uh, now, when I think of it, I sort of get a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, anyway, that was one of them. Then uh, we were getting ready to join. In fact, that. I beg your pardon. Um, after the aborted one, uh, let's see, for four, uh, another, another 12 days, uh, we were doing all sorts of things, I guess. We were uh, taking courses and doing things like that. And then um, we joined the 13th Air Force. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we would be involved with the 13th Air Force until we went home uh, in September. And, uh, <coughs> uh, we took off from, we were transported from uh, Nadzab to a little island called Biak. And again, if, uh, if you think of Borneo as, I mean, uh, New Guinea as being uh, a hill monster, in the neck, Biak is right in, in a little island, there's one or two islands in there. And uh, can you spell so. that, please? Hmm? 
Bayak, was it? B I A K. Bayak. Bayak. And again, we were in transport. Uh, uh, we were not involved with a, a, a full organization yet. We were in a replacement. By the way, the replacement depot uh, was in a large, evidently, it was a, 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 a grassy field before they moved in. And we were living in a tent. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a, uh, um, uh, a dusty mess. And we had water, which was rationed. Uh, we were told that we could only have a pint of water a day. And at one time, somebody came by and said, hey, you want to do uh, some uh, pistol uh, practice? And I said, sure. But we had 45 pistols, uh, 45 uh, mil uh, yeah, uh, caliber uh, pistols. And uh, so we went, hopped on this truck, and we went within a mile or so from the field, and there was a rushing stream coming down the, the uh, Owen, Owen Stanley mountain ranges. And beautiful, clear, <laughs> and, and you just, just take a mouthful of it, a splash it over your head, and it was just wonderful. And uh, we threw some cans or something in, in the water and shot them with our pistols. Uh, and some guys were swimming, well, we were told that we were precious until our first mission, after we got in the Air Force. So we couldn't jeopardize our bodies. <laughs> well, uh, we got to Biak, and uh, I just look at the water, the South Pacific water. South Pacific water has less salt than the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's absolutely lovely to swim in. And it, it was warm. And uh, so uh, uh, I just took off and dove in around the, uh, off the shore. By the way, it, it all the only part of the island that was owned by uh, the U.S. was a strip along the shore. And it was an airstrip, and then they had, they had rows of tents for people like us who would drop in for uh, two days or so, and then we'd move on. And uh, down between the rows were machine gun emplacements to take care of those people up in the escarpment who were the owners of the rest of the island. And we could hear them. And they evidently, they were able to make sake. And they were having a great, a great old time. And every once in a while, it was not nice to hear, but every once in a while, uh, one of those scraggly little guys would come down and uh, stand in the, in the mess line. And somebody who uh, would turn around and get shot would take the gun out and shoot them. And I mean, it's horrible to think of, but they, they must have been berserk up there. And uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I was told that I shouldn't go out and swim in the water because uh, they were, when they took the island, they lost a lot of machinery and, and, uh, um, and there's a lot of rusting iron out there. And he said, you know, that, that you could rip, rip a, a muscle off your leg or something like that. So I said, okay. Uh, but then the fellow said, there is a place you can swim though. I said, okay, where? And uh, so we went down the coast, we were hopping a jeep and we went down this, and there was a sinkhole off the, just off the water, and maybe uh, 15, 20 feet from the water. And it was 20 feet across, I suppose, and then it went down. And there was enough light so I could see all the way down the bottom, and right on the bottom was a samurai sword. And uh, I looked at it, and I looked at this fellow who, got me there, and my question was, well, how come it's down there? And I don't think it stayed down there very long, because it's metal, made of metal and they drop a, a, a magnet and pick it up. Mm -hmm. But he said, be my guest. So uh, I and a couple of others, uh, we dove down, swam as far as we could for down, and it was still a great distance. Uh, and it, we just, uh, underwater is a dis distance of uh, perspective. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. Uh, impossible to judge. And uh, um, anyway, it, it impressed me. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing a series of paintings of uh, swimming with fish. And one of the ones, I just happened to think of that, and I hadn't thought of it for years. And so I did a painting of it, showing the, the, the light of the light, daylight way up here, and all this, all the way down is this sword, just in a, it's almost a spotlight. Um, and uh, I'm quite sure that it disappeared within a day or so, as soon as they get whatever it is necessary to grab it. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe one of the seals uh, 
uh, uh, Navy SEALs would mm -hmm. find a way of getting done. Uh, anyway, that was a moment of uh, sort of pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Now, at the time you were stationed at Biak Island, it was a We were stationed there. Oh. We were in transit. You were in transit. Yeah. So the, we're talking maybe early 1945 by now? February. February 45. This was in, okay. uh, yeah, it was between February 14th and February 26th. Uh, <clears throat> so it was in February. All right. And what happened? Uh, where were you being transported? To the island of Moratai. 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 Mm -hmm. In the Helna Harris, which is now part of Indonesia. Well, was part of Indonesia at the time. Indonesia was actually created by the Japanese. It was part of their empire. Mm -hmm. And they literally pulled it together as a unit. And all those different islands. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we got to Maritai. And Maritai was similar to Biak, except it was a bigger island, much bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, but Again, uh, the, uh, our territory was just big enough to hold uh, uh, the people who were there and a contingent of um, uh, U.S. Army uh, who kept the Japanese at bay. And they occupied the rest of the island. And evidently, they, they were very casual about it. And uh, it was a very easy occupation for U.S. troops. And, uh, uh, they don't know why, but uh, it was an, uh, they moved in, and these they uh, maybe they didn't think it was strategically very important. Well, for us, it was great because it was closer to Borneo, and therefore within uh, bombing range, and also uh, we could bomb uh, we could bomb the Philippines from that too. Um, so what happened was that uh, oh the the physical situation is a, um, a balloon up here, which is the the main island. And then there's an airstrip across here. Mm -hmm. And I've gone to uh, 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 the, the Google Earth uh, to look at some of these things <laughs> recently. And uh, it's all overgrown now. In other words, the island is not that important. But, um, and then the, the airstrip is across the bottom of it. Then there's a strip down here, Carl Strip, that is about a mile wide, and went down. That's where everybody lived. And we moved into a tent that was occupied by somebody else. And it, it, life was so calm and comfortable there. Uh, there's a constant breeze uh, from one side to the other. There are no insects. Uh, the air was, of course, warm in, in the mm -hmm. tropics. And, uh, uh, and the, they had, uh, 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 the people who had been in a tent before had cut down the main tent pole and they put a couple of uh, pieces of furniture or something underneath it. And it was a very comfortable place to live. And uh, it had a reputation of being a very comfortable place to live and much more relaxed than most of the areas that uh, we might uh, move to. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and I, I love the, the fact that the, the shelf went out, the coral shelf went out, and then there was a, the, the surf would build up and would come in and then uh, it would, uh, all the water that was on the shelf, almost all the water would go out. It'd still be about five or six inches deep. And it was strong enough in the undertow to knock me off. The, we had to wear boots when we were walking on the car, car mm -hmm. because it's so rough. <coughs> and uh, I was knocked over. And the only scar I have from, <laughs> from uh, the service is across my knee. And it's still there, but you can just barely see it for a long time. Just a purple gash. It just looked horrible, but it was nothing really. And, uh, uh, and once uh, somebody said, uh, you want to go swimming out there? And uh, they had an inflated boat. So we got the boat. And when the water came in, uh, it rose up fairly high. And then there was a moment where it was very quiet so that you could actually paddle out beyond the, the drop-off point uh, from the, the coral. Uh, it was a real, um, I have no idea how far it went down. Anyway, we paddled like mad and got out beyond the escarpment, I guess you have to call it. Uh, and then uh, the water came out, and uh, there was no water back here. Also, it built, it built up this great wave that was going to crash in again. And you could see down uh, on this, this coral, it was literally a water wall of coral all the way down, and I, I thought it was 20 or 30 feet down but just for a moment, and then it filled up, and then, then you were on top of this wave that went in again. 
And uh, we, we had company out there, lots of sharks. You could just see them swimming around there. Well, I only did that once. And, uh, 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 and I remember it as being, weather-wise, it was idyllic. And uh, uh, we didn't have, well, we had some palm trees and things like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, um, and I don't remember the food. Uh, and at one moment, uh, somebody uh, asked us uh, if we wanted, some of the army asked us if we wanted to go and go into the, the woods and get some war souvenirs. We said, no, we weren't interested in doing that. <laughs> they, that, that literally, they meant go and shoot an enemy and then take their personal effects from them mm -hmm. and uh, get photographs of girlfriends and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it you know, it's, uh, wasn't uh, quite our game at the time. Well, and and anyway, let me see. Let's see. What was your next mission after you get? Yeah, so we're in more time. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, we went to that the oil farmer, the, the Borneo, and uh, I got this Zolo. I don't remember that, but uh, and then uh, more time, more time. Yeah, and uh, we stayed there until March the twelfth. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we were there for. Uh, maybe a half a month, and then uh, evidently things had cooled enough, cooled enough on Samar for us to go up there. Okay. But in the meanwhile, there was this standard, the 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 line of um, uh, storms uh, was moving north, and it it goes back and forth uh, in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. and it was going up, and the rainy season was starting in the Philippines. Okay. So we got. There, just in time for the rainy season. And we had this tent. We, we inherited the tent. Oh, by, I forgot. The, the fellows who owned the tent previous to us went into the jungles and got a parrot, which was called Polly, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, so I have a drawing that I did of Polly. And, and I, uh, because it, was, it roosted on our, uh, at the tent, uh, I fed it, and uh, so it became my friends. And uh, I think anyone who fed it was its friend. And what I would do is uh, um, tell somebody to, to come up to me with uh, a belligerent attitude. And they'd come like that, and I'd hold my arm up. This thing would run down here, grab my finger, and go <laughs> And it would swear. So when they, when they captured, and I saw the gloves, the, the heavy gloves, that they're all shredded. Uh, when they capture it, uh, they clipped its wings so it couldn't fly, and uh, uh, and then they put it on a, a roost and they fed it. But uh, the words that it heard the first time are the ones it remembered, <laughs> and it it would get on my shoulder and nibble my ear and say these loving things. <laughs> they were just, I mean, it was it was, mm. it was fun, but uh, and these are these are. Brief moments, and uh, and and we, we went. Well, we only went on about three missions in there. One, two, three. We had f uh, f three missions, mm -hmm. four missions, and then <clears throat> we hopped on a plane. And oh, by the way, <clears throat> another thing I didn't tell anyone when I went in the service, and I almost flunked out of uh, navigation school because of it. I have motion sickness. Oh dear. <laughs> yes. And uh, <clears throat> as a kid, I would stand at a dock and get sick, or just see the ocean, I'd get sick. Uh, and I was car sick, uh, uh, street car sick, uh, I get sick all the time. I had in an automobile, oh, you know about it. <laughs> I'd have to, in an automobile, I would have to be at the window and open the window in order to survive the, the trips. and. Uh, uh, and I knew this, but I didn't tell anyone. When I was in, um, in the um, training uh, up in Amherst, we had 10 hours of flight. I was fine, no problems whatsoever. In other words, I was in the center of gravity of the, of the plane and uh, no problem. And uh, by the time we went up to the Philippines, I, I had forgotten, oh, when I was in navigation school, uh, there were three positions for the navigator as a cadet. And one was very close to the pilot, and he was navigator number one. And he was in control of the direction of the, of the plane. And then behind him was the follow navigator, which is what most navigators do anyway. Uh, 
And so he, that position, those positions were easy. But then the easiest was way in the tail. And in a propeller plane, the tail fishes, fish tails mm -hmm. through space because of the torque mm -hmm. of, the, of the engines. And uh, uh, every time I get in the back, my head just turn off, literally. I could not see, I couldn't, I couldn't think, uh, I couldn't look through the, the drift meter. Uh, uh, and I wasn't sick to my stomach, it was just all in my head. Mm -hmm. And it just stopped me. And uh, I, I, uh, uh, no one ever said anything to me about it. But I'm, I'm quite sure I'm not the only one. Uh, and uh, then after, uh, after quite a while, uh, we had final exams. And uh, the final exam in the, the position, the third position, is called pilotage. We literally, <clears throat> you can look out the window and you use a road map to see where you were. <laughs> and <clears throat> so what I, uh, for my final, evidently, I was flunking. because I was not going to pass this thing. But I passed everything else. And so one day I was asked to sit in the co-pilot seat and do pilotage. And there's no problem whatsoever. And so I graduated. And, but the point is here that we were put in the waist of a transport plane to fly up to the Philippines. And uh, uh, the, uh, the pilots and the pilots and co-pilots were there too. I was extremely amused because when we were in the flight, we went through storms and, it, and this is bad weather. And uh, instead of going around them, I said, it doesn't make any difference. We go through this one, we're gonna get another one right here. So we went through and we bounced all over the place. The pilots got sick <laughs> and I was not affected. So evidently just bouncing around the heavens was good. And my, my inner ear, whatever it is that causes that problem, uh, uh, was at least temporarily solved. And uh, when I got out of the service, I was able to go on roller coasters and all sorts of things for several years and uh, no problems. Now, not so hot. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we finally got up to the Philippines, up to Samar, and uh, uh, it was in the middle of the rainy season. We set up our tent and we had a, a Filipino, I thought he was a young kid. It turned out he was 25 and married with children. They look young. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, yeah. anyway, he helped us beat down some of the coral bumps so that the floor of the tent wasn't quite as bad. As, and uh, it was that, that horrible situation. Oh, by the way, when at night, if your nose touched the, the and it's raining out, touched the, the canvas, it began to leak through. Mm. So uh, it was not pleasant for a long while. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, we were able to save enough booze <laughs> uh, to buy <clears throat> plywood for the floor, and we got some empty barrels, uh, set it up, and uh, then we screened it in, and it was a, a, a quite a lovely place after a while. So, <clears throat> but in uh, our, the, uh, my memory of what happened, generally speaking, is extremely poor. Actually, I have mm. blanks, and if I hadn't made this long list of uh, from the, I kept track of, of uh, all the flights, and uh, it's sort of a thing that a navigator most likely would do, and uh, and those were the uh, the uh, the two. Uh, uh, I had two uh, log uh, log forms, uh, which uh, one was one was uh, clipped to a piece of cardboard, and. Uh, uh, I dug it out a few, uh, about a month ago, <clears throat> because I wanted to know precisely what the uh, mm. position were in these, uh, the early missions. And literally, I, I do not me remember getting up in the morning going to these, uh, I, generally I remember the kinds of things I did, but uh, I don't remember what went on most of this. Uh, and uh, anyway, I, I took the, the log off the piece of cardboard and I found out Underneath it was this mm -hmm. pastel drawing of a B-24 in flight, uh, which I had done. Uh, it, it sometime, I think, I'm not sure when I did it. I most likely did it in, in uh, mm -hmm. the Philippines. Because I had, I had oil paints and uh, pastels and pastel paper with me. But this was done on a piece of cardboard. Wow. So, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm rather surprised it is as accurate, by the way, that little bump 
there yeah. is my bump. Okay. Uh, that's the, it's a plastic um, a viewing uh, that you would shoot the uh, uh, stars and the sun from. That's a wonderful uh, picture. I was surprised it was as good as it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but most of the, uh, this, I, I, I made this list because mm -hmm. a friend of mine asked me to do a, uh, to write, a, write some uh, recounts of what I did in the service and I couldn't think of anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I told about the, the first mission uh, where the uh, pilot said they're shooting at us because I thought that was funny. And then uh, there's one other mission, uh, and uh, I was most affected by it, and I, I don't remember remembering it earlier, uh, but I, and I didn't tell anyone about it until this just uh, within the past year, uh, when I was asked to, to write something about it. And uh, it was the longest flight we had ever made. It was uh, over 15 hours. And uh, we, my memory was that we left Samar, the easternmost of the islands of the Philippines, and we flew to, the, to uh, Palawan Island, which is the westernmost. And the name of the town in Palawan Island, you can't forget because it's oh, Principesa. It's a, uh, 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 not Principesa. Puerto Princesa, the princess port. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and I remember we flew there and then uh, we bumped at the end of the runway and there were B-25, which is a twin engine uh, bomber, uh, taking off all night over our heads. And, no, and they're noisy, they're noisy planes. And, uh, and in the meanwhile, our planes were having uh, half the bomb bays, uh, half the structure of the bomb bays taken out and uh, gasoline tanks put in. And uh, then the next day we flew out and uh, I, I, well, it was, it was in the morning, early in the morning, we flew down to <coughs> uh, uh, Brunei Bay uh, in, uh, uh, and uh, there was an airfield that evidently was giving the shipping lanes a tough time, and uh, uh, and the Australians were getting ready for an invasion, but uh, they had to get rid of this one airfield, uh, or or they couldn't even get near it. Uh, and uh, uh, I learned that more recently. I did not know that uh, that's what we were doing, and but I did know that we were going down for that airfield, and uh, so what we did was take off, and a, a usual situation, we would take off and fly for. Uh, maybe five, six hours, uh, and then we would rendezvous with other planes, and then as a as a uh, a squadron, or maybe even larger than a single squadron, we would fly over the target area and drop bombs, and then break up immediately because we would be a, a big target for both anti-aircraft and for uh, pursuit planes, and uh, and that's exactly what we did, and we we ended up uh, we saw no other planes after the bomb run. And during the bomb run, I re remember distinctly seeing our bombs drop, because that's, that's what my job was, and uh, then I saw planes trying to take off, and then they're being destroyed by our bombs. So mm -hmm. we were knocking out the ones that would have knocked us out if, uh, if they had not been damaged. Uh, so we, <clears throat> we took off and went into the, cent the central part of the uh, of Borneo, and then headed north, and there was an island. There was a, uh, a mountain, and we were awfully close to it. I was nervous, and there was a cloud cover. We couldn't see it, uh, and the pilot said, "You know, we we'll keep on." We had radar at the time, and uh, radar. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't the radar we have in planes today, which uh, it has the. Uh, I think the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the antenna is on the inside of the plane someplace. Uh, there was a bomb. And, uh, or housing, and it dropped down. And if you drop this thing down, you lose five, uh, five miles an hour airspeed. And so the pilot said, we're not gonna do that. And uh, well, what happened in this trip, uh, uh, we hit the northern, northern edge of Borneo, 
and there's a tiny little island, and I'm trying to, I tried to find out which one it is, and I think I know which photo, I'm not sure, <laughs> so I can't, I can't tell. But uh, I knew that we were going to go, go across the Sulu Sea, which is nothing but water. We, and there was nothing there for a, a landmark. Uh, and so I saw this one little island, and I corrected the, the, air, the uh, direction, uh, airspeed in the direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the wind direction. And uh, then uh, it was late in the afternoon. Um, the, uh, we could, the, the cloud cover, uh, we had cloud un underneath us. We could not see, uh, actually, if there, if there are uh, some white caps, you can actually use the white caps for the direction of the wind. But there was a cover of uh, clouds, uh, and we couldn't see that. Uh, we were b between clouds. In fact, I think there were several cloud there, mm -hmm. and the sun was beginning to go down. Now, two things were happening. One, uh, it was it was beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. We were living inside of a sunset, and it was changing all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was I was fascinated by it. Uh, but the other thing was that I couldn't see uh, I couldn't see the sea. Uh, if we came across some land. I wasn't able to tell what, whether it wasn't a shadow of a cloud or land. And the other thing was that the radio wouldn't work because the heavy side layer at sunset was broken up and the radio waves uh, about, uh, scattered uh, so that you could not use a radio compass. And uh, in my story, when I wrote it, I just said, this navigator was blind. And but it was it was worse than that. I was going back and forth between be, between the uh, two pilots. I'd look up over there, look, seeing if I could see something way in the future, way out in the, and then go back down. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, front turret, uh, gun turret, was in the way. <clears throat> so finally, I said that I can't do anything, and it's the only time in the entire time in the South Pacific that. Uh, I could not navigate it. I didn't. I wasn't sure that the wind hadn't changed. Uh, there was a changing uh, um, uh, cloud condition, and so the weather, weather could have changed. Uh, the, the winds could have changed, and uh, we might have been off course. <clears throat> so I had no idea. Uh, I had no. I had no no tools uh, to work with, and so finally I said. I'm not going to worry about it. I've done as much as I can at the moment. So the bombardier was asleep. The front gunner, the nose gunner was asleep. And uh, most likely everybody else in the plane was asleep, except for one, usually one pilot slept and the other one stayed awake. And the engineer. The engineer was the one who was watching the gasoline. So I climbed into the front turret. And I was in front of the plane. I was in and right here. I was out in front of the entire plane, and it was as if I were floating in the air without even the machine behind me. And uh, uh, so, uh, and I remember for a brief moment, and I have no idea how long, uh, but for a brief moment, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I call it serendipitous, because I was enjoying it. I wasn't worried. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know uh, where we were or whether we were off course or not. Uh, I said, I, I did as much as I can, and I can't do anything. We should stay the course, no matter what. Uh, then, uh, finally, the light was dimming more and more, and uh, uh, the cloud cover below disappeared, but there were shadows of the clouds on the sea, and I couldn't tell whether they were land or not. Uh, so there was a confusion. I couldn't see the profiles of mm -hmm. any piece of land. And uh, we had to go well over 200 miles of nothing but water. And then finally, the, the, we, this is, uh, we we're going across all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were heading for that spot. Mm -hmm. where, yeah. yeah. Um, we we're heading for this tiny little spot here where my finger is. And we started out down here. And I assume we went in a straight line. <laughs> uh, 
So the in between, and so this all this water, uh, is, uh, and and uh, there was Negros, the island of Negros, uh, that we may have gone over. We saw some light lines at one time, but we could not see any uh, any shorelines, and there was nothing that I could use, and uh, so I. Uh, uh, say that I, I just decided to uh, make sure that we just stayed on the course. However, at that very time when it was really getting dark, we started getting radio messages from other people from the, from the squadron. And uh, uh, they were saying, we're running out of fuel, uh, we're ditching. Uh, we've missed the, we missed some, uh, we've missed Giwan, which is the name of the little town. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we're going down one message after the other of these uh, of the part of the squadron, uh, and uh, uh, my the pilot I have to say he didn't want to do anything when we got close to the mountain, and he didn't let me drop the uh, the uh, <clears throat> radar after he dropped the radar we would have been right on target and uh, wouldn't have been, but he didn't do that and as a result uh, we had fuel to make the. And uh, when, uh, for my own personal gratification, I could see the lights of the, uh, of the field directly in front of us when we were going. So, uh, yeah. and, uh, so it was, uh, and <clears throat> when we did this, we had no idea there was, uh, was a special flight. Well, it turned out when I uh, accessed the history of the 13th Air Force, this, this was the longest flight of any B-24 and not just in the South Pacific, of any B-24 of any time. 15 hours and 15 minutes. And, uh, <clears throat> but what, uh, and in the, in the history, what it did not say was that, uh, and I don't know uh, whether we actually lost those people or not, but uh, they went down in the ocean. And uh, if you missed, if you missed the, uh, the landing strip, the next piece of land was Hawaii. So and maybe maybe some of the islands, but uh, mm -hmm. that was it. In other words, if you missed it, uh, you had to you had to ditch. And uh, we heard that there were about there were several of them. Were, they were going down. They ran out of fuel, uh, and they did not see the air field. Uh, so if all they had to do is be one degree uh, to the south, and they would not have seen the airfield. It'd be far enough away mm -hmm. when they got to that point. So. Um, it, it's it's uh, nervous to think about it, but at the time, well, I was I wasn't nervous. I, I I was just beside myself because I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it was the only time in the entire time I was in the service that I felt ineffective. I could not. I, I had there's nothing I could do to to solve the problem or to make it easier. Mm -hmm. And that was it. So. It wasn't fear, it was almost, you know, yeah. I don't know. Uh, so <clears throat> we, uh, I think we got an air medal for it. <laughs> but we didn't know that. And uh, uh, oh, we, we, got, we knew we got air medals and things like that. And uh, we got ribbons for being in one, one uh, group of uh, activity or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it didn't mean anything. And we figured it was just a way of keeping tabs on things. Mm -hmm. And also, we didn't receive them. Uh, and when I got out of the service, I was up in Fort Devens, and uh, the fellow looked at my, he said, I, I, I know you've got a whole lot of things coming, but they haven't caught up with you yet. So he said, you'll have to go home for 45 days. <laughs> well, the war was over. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, at this time, the war was over. And the, and right. the the surprise to me when I started looking at the flights was that that particular flight was the 28th of uh, April 28th. Mm -hmm. And the first week in June, we flew every day, which is unusual. Usually you fly every other day uh, and they allow you to uh, recuperate a little bit. And, uh, and that, that's a standard rule. But we went over to Palawan Island, and according to the history, uh, Palawan Island, and flew out of it, going down to approximately the same areas. And uh, we were softening up 
the, the, uh, the enemy uh, stronghold uh, for the Australians. And evidently, it was, it was highly successful, mm -hmm. according to the history. Right. <laughs> well, during your time um, that you were stationed out there, were you made aware of victory in Germany, uh, VE Day? In May. We heard, we, we, got, we got that. Uh, okay. And uh, not only that, but uh, uh, some of the people who actually fought in the Battle of the Bulge came out to the South Pacific getting ready for the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. And the invasion of Japan was, it was a, re a real progress. It was, uh, uh, we were up, we were bombing Formosa, and uh, I went up, went up to uh, uh, Okinawa and landed, and they were preparing to uh, use that as a takeoff point. So there's, there's no question that the atom bomb was a horrible thing. And uh, uh, I think that if you're far enough away from the, the enemy and, and the people, because uh, it's the, 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 the diplomats aren't the ones fighting the war. Uh, and uh, the ones who get killed, uh, and the, the phrase that I, I dislike more than any other phrase, uh, is uh, collateral mm. damage, because that usually means a lot of people get killed. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned before the interview that on the day the bomb was dropped, there were no flights. Right. And I think that was, uh, I think it was done on purpose, because uh, we did not fly that day, and we flew the next. We were flying on the second one. Uh, when the second one dropped, uh, we were in the air. In fact, I think we were, we were on the way up to uh, 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 Formosa. It was on August 5th, no, August 6th. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't put down when the second one was, but it was about a week or so after. Uh, I believe that one was August 9th. We were bombing Formosa. Wow. So they were getting it. And if they hadn't decided at that time that it was time to stop. Uh, and I have to uh, thank uh, MacArthur. He went in and uh, they had a great respect for him. And he, he also allowed the, uh, uh, the emperor to remain. And uh, it solved the problem. The, now there's, there's not gonna be a, a reaction of the people against him if the emperor was still there. And uh, he was able to do that. So, uh, but uh, but I was wondering why uh, the 35th mission was. Oh, when we came back, uh, I, I have uh, one of these one of these brown sheets. I have uh, said that uh, I was relieved of duty f for medical reasons, and I have no idea what it was. And uh, I'm going to go to a friend in the American Legion and see if he can look up my medical record, see if it's on it. But the chances are it wasn't that complete. So overall, you flew 45 missions. And uh, where were you when uh, VJ Day was declared, uh, when the Japanese surrendered? Yeah, what was the specific? Oh, uh, well, I think it was like September 1st when they yeah, signed I, the treaty. I have a, I have a, I have a, uh, a menu from a Manila restaurant that says it was seventh, but uh -huh. I don't think okay. it was seventh. I think it was, yeah. it, it, it was about that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe I was in the restaurant on, uh -huh. on the seventh. <laughs> but, uh, but I was on my way home. Uh, uh -huh. uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and this, uh, and I was wondering why, you know, why some of these, the things, all the, the last 10, um, my 35th mission was, yeah, when we came back from uh, Bo uh, the Borneo business, well, at the end of that week, until July the 9th, no, uh, July 7th, uh, there was a whole, uh, ooh, no. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, uh, the 9th was the last Borneo mission, and then uh, until July 13th, I have no flights. So I was most likely on medical leave for some reason or other, and I have no mm -hmm. idea. I, mm -hmm. have, I have no recollection whatsoever, because I wasn't having any medical problems. And I, I might have been underweight, because we had the, 
The best food, if, you, if you're going to go into the service and you want to have good food, go to the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> if they've, got, they've got the food on board. And uh, we had the worst food of, I don't know, even sea rations would be better. Uh, now we had uh, beef out of a can, which came from Australia and was mostly loaded with nitrates, and uh, uh, powdered potatoes, powdered eggs for breakfast, and, and coffee, black coffee, well, coffee, and uh, uh, condensed milk, and uh, the thick, sweet stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I take it you weren't 135 pounds by the time you finished. Oh, I was not. I, in fact, I have no idea. Uh -huh. I was back to my 119 at least, mm. uh, because when uh, uh, my parents picked me up at, at uh, Fort Devens, and they said I looked like a scarecrow. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, I was home for 45 days, and I would say I ate like a pig. <laughs> and uh, and the photographs of me, uh, I look fine. I look healthy, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, uh, and it was the first time I was a able to wear my uniform. So I was in for two and a half years, and I never went to a USO. Uh, I uh, didn't go to, I mean, you hear all these, these uh, the social life of, mm -hmm. of, of, of offices and things like that. Yeah. Not a bit of it, not a bit of it. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we, but, but the, the food, I think what kept me alive was the bananas I bought of the little girl who came by every morning. And uh, uh, they were delicious and they were small things and not big. And, uh, uh, but they tasted good. And the other was not good. I mean, it didn't taste good, uh, and you ate it because you had to eat it. The good thing about being in the Air Force is that we suffered like everybody else in the, in the, in the rain and in all that stuff and mud and, uh, and the hot, steamy weather. But when we got in the plane, went up where it was nice and cool. <laughs> good. And, and, well, that was uh, one good thing about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. a... Uh, I actually liked the tropics, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I didn't like, well, in the service, in the service, people, we were all doing the same thing, and uh, uh, we were concentrating on a particular job, and there's no question that that is what our job was, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was, wasn't rah-rah, mm -hmm. uh, no one was doing it for the medals, uh, they were just doing it because, mm -hmm. uh, well, we're all, either we got drafted or we volunteer. Okay. In fact, we are all volunteers. So, uh, Thomas, okay. at the time you were discharged, and I take it, it was like the fall of 45 or so, a little bit, uh, give or take? No. 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 Uh, I wasn't discharged either. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I hadn't realized, but one of the, the sheet that is my discharge mm -hmm. wasn't a discharge because no one was discharged when the war was over. <clears throat> You got a separation from the service mm -hmm. because you were in, when you signed in, when you took an oath, you were in for the duration and six months. So mm -hmm. six months after the end of the war, you could get, uh, you could get separation from the service right. completely. When you were separated, what was your rank? Oh, second lieutenant. Second. I became second lieutenant in the spring of uh, 45. Okay. Yeah. And I don't even remember. And do you remember where you were discharged? Philippines. Oh, oh. where? Was it? Well, it's 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 not it's, it's not a straight line. Uh -huh. uh, when I got uh, I got home for forty five days, I just uh, uh, enjoyed myself, and then I had to go back down to Greensboro, North Carolina, where I I went into where I had my mm -hmm. twenty eight days of bad experience, and uh, uh, to get ushered out of the service, and. Uh, there's a doctor down there, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, oh, I said, I'd like to fly to get some flying pay. And uh, uh, he said, uh, sorry, but you can't fly. You, you didn't pass, pass the physical. I said, why not? He said, because you're underweight. And I said, underweight? I said, two months ago, I was a shadow of what I am now, <laughs> and I was flying. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, you can fly. <laughs> and then we had bad weather, so I didn't fly anymore. Right. Uh, but um, then uh, when I came back home, uh, I had uh, a terminal leave. And since I had taken no leave for well over a year, I guess it was another 45 days. And uh, so in the middle of the spring, 
Uh, I started at Tufts University, and uh, <laughs> Tufts College, I think it was at the time, not a university. And <clears throat> uh, when I was home for the four to five, 45 days, I went to the Tufts, and uh, that's why I say the, the uh, uh, a bunch of tests they gave us were just like the tests we got in the service, and the same format. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and I got in, and uh, I was a chemistry major. And uh, uh, in fact, it's what I wanted to do when I was in high school. I, it was chemistry, I loved it, and uh, I thought that's what I'm gonna do. And art, uh, I never thought that I would have a career in, in uh, doing anything to do with art, uh, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that I was busy with it all the time. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, the, uh, I remember in my, Junior, I, I was a member of the, uh, I was in the reserve, and uh, it was not very effective because there was no money, and we couldn't fly. And so we'd have meetings and we'd just chit chat, and that was no good. But uh, so I, in my, I thought that I had actually uh, cut out the reserve uh, in my junior year of college because I went down to Haiti, and I figured that if I'm going to be traveling, I don't want to, I'm missing the reserve meetings and things like that. Uh, but I didn't, uh, and it was 1955, that much later, that I was still in the reserve. And, uh, um, uh, and I do have a, uh, a, a termination of my mm -hmm. services from that, so. And, uh, Were you uh, ever called up for uh, Korea? I expected it, uh -huh. and nothing happened. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe they didn't need navigators. It was just over the line, after all. <laughs> right. So uh, um, you were a chemistry major at Tufts, and you were also an artist. Uh, what did you do? Uh, you mean how did why? this happen? <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I was one of the first people to graduate after the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, as a result, all of a sudden, the market was flooded. Uh, and I was, a, I was not an engineer, uh, and uh, most of the jobs that were available were for chemical engineers. <clears throat> and I remember uh, uh, I was told that uh, I went down to, I think it was New Jersey, and, and uh, checked uh, the, to see whether I couldn't go over to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, for Aramco, the uh, Arabian uh, American oil company. And uh, it was a nice deal. Um, uh, you work for three years, you get $3,000 a year. Doesn't sound like much now, mm -hmm. but uh, you would have ten, about $10,000 in the bank after three years mm -hmm. uh, because your room and board was taken care of and uh, you had, uh, as, as uh, the fellow said, it was, he said, and you can have a houseboy or a high school to clean your place. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, but then it turned out that I didn't have, my mathematics was, wasn't uh, intense enough. And uh, uh, then uh, I said, okay. Uh, and I tried a few other places, and that was the one drawback. Uh, so either I would go on and get a master's and uh, bolster up my navigation, I mean my uh, navigation, my Chemistry. Uh, mathematics <laughs> skills. Uh, uh, but in the meanwhile, uh, I had been taking courses at the museum school. Mm -hmm. And I had an ex a painting of mine in an exhibit with a lot of the second and third year students and I looked at my painting, and I looked at their painting, I said, technically theirs are better than mine, but mine is a better painting. That's, that's the ego of the art. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so what I did was uh, apply for the museum school, and I had, um, I told a little lie uh, to the uh, uh, Veterans Administration. Uh, uh, I said, I've got some GI Bill left, so maybe mm -hmm. I can use that for, uh, for a year in, in the museum school in Boston. And uh, uh, the fellow looked at me and said, that sounds to me as if you're changing your goal and that's not allowed. I said, oh no, I'm not changing my mind. You see, I want to be in public relations in, in uh, uh, the chemical industry and I want to be able to uh, understand format of, of uh, advertisements and, and so a year in the museum school would give me that basis. And he looked at me and he said, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> so he, I mean, he knew I was stringing a line, but, uh -huh. but I also, I had, I had not given up on chemistry. 
because uh, I said, this is nonsense. Going to, you can't make a living as an artist. Uh, I mean, most artists, it's like uh, popular music. Well, I think maybe you can make a better living at popular music than mm -hmm. you can as an artist. And uh, <clears throat> so I went to the museum school and I went through in the GI Bill uh, for one year. And then I was a, a fellowship after that, a scholarship after that. Uh, and uh, uh, while I was there, I remember uh, the last job, I actually had a job, a carbide and carbon chemistry, a chemical company in uh, uh, Connecticut. And uh, because of the rumbles of North Korea, or Korea, uh, they said they canceled the program I was in. And they said, we're sorry, but uh, we don't know if we're going to be making shoe polish or bombs. So I said, OK. And that's when I just went out in the street and I started drawing, drawings, doing drawings of kids and everything else, and a couple of little still life oil paintings, and, and uh, put a portfolio together. And I got accepted in museum school, and uh, which is not a, I think, modicum of talent you could do that, uh, because they assume that uh, I think it's one quarter of the class will move on to the second year. I and mean, it's that big a drop off mm -hmm. every year at, the, at that time. There's no, no degree. <coughs> and uh, uh, so uh, within the first month or so, I got a call from a foundry in South Boston. They needed to have a, uh, uh, a test chemist uh, to uh, uh, check on their samples as they came out of the foundry. And I had taken a course in metallurgy of iron and steel. I could have done it just like that. Mm -hmm. And I always said to myself, uh, it's a good thing I didn't get the telephone call at home. Because mm -hmm. my father, when he heard I was going to go to art school, he, ah, he thought I was going to be an engineer. And uh, he wanted an engineer in the family. That was his sort of a goal for his children. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one who uh, went to college from the, mm -hmm. well, my Sister and brother took some courses, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was a disappointment for him. And uh, uh, but at the end of uh, he became very proud when I got a fellowship to the American Academy in Rome. <laughs> Two and a half years of <laughs> studio and uh, uh, studio and, and room space and, and a stipend to travel. It was very nice. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, so what, a, uh, oh, by the way, the, the, the foundry in South Boston called me and uh, I told them that I was otherwise occupied. And so I kept at it, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened, uh, I, I ended up by going to the, uh, to the, by the way, when I got to uh, 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 Tufts, a, a good friend of mine was a second lieutenant in the infantry in the South Pacific. And uh, uh, he had had, we went out for beers one night and he told me a story. And uh, I don't think I had a story to tell him. And, but other than that, I never talked about this stuff. And, uh, and I think it's the reason that I've forgotten it. In fact, I had to look up the 31st bomb group and the 5th, uh, the 31st um, squadron of the fifth bomb group. And I had to look it up because I had forgotten it. And uh, I used to reel it off. You know, somebody said, well, what did you do? And I knew my numbers and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't know them anymore. And it's as if I just put them out of my mind and I went on with my life. And I think that's more true with people from the Second World War than uh, some of the later. And I mean, I, I just did not understand uh, the Afghanistan and Iraqi uh, flag waving. I mean. It, the, and the flags are all made in China. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it, it's a completely different psychological reaction. And I have, I have plenty of sympathy for the, the guys who get hurt. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no shortage of sympathy for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're patriots, and uh, they did what they wanted to do. They volunteered. Uh, and we had to go in or. And, uh, uh, I don't, uh, that's not, I don't think it's, a, it's negative, uh, but we were going to get, um, well, the country needed a, an army. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay, everybody has a number. And when it comes up, you're in. So. Speaking so. of something that's been made, 
you made this back in 2015, and yes. can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I belong to an organization. Uh, I was asked to illustrate, uh, uh, oh, when I finished teaching, Mm -hmm. We haven't even gone in, into that, but okay. uh, when I finished teaching, I was teaching at Emerson College, I was mm -hmm. the chairman of the Fine Arts Department, and uh, uh, I, I actually left, uh, it was in uh, 94, but a lot earlier than that I had decided to leave, and uh, uh, I met a fellow who said, uh, he was on a board with me, and, and uh, he said, would you be interested in illustrating a book? I said, sure. Why not? And uh, because I was going to be relieved of teaching responsibilities, and and actually, I've had a second career after leaving teaching in illustrating books and uh, mm -hmm. and doing paintings and things like that. And <clears throat> so, uh, uh, he and his brother were writing this book on the uh, the um, the history of the Middlesex Canal, which I had never heard of. <laughs> and uh, however. I, as in high school, I used to swim in a cold stream coming down from Winchester into the Upper Mystic Lakes. And it was where there was an aqueduct that the canal went across. So I actually had more experience with the canal than I, <laughs> I realized. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I got involved with uh, those two fellows. I did a, uh, illustrated uh, the book and uh, um, we got associated with the with the association, a Middlesex Canal Association, and some of the members decided to um, have a, a meeting place up in Billerica uh, where the canal started. The first digging of the, that was at the, uh, at the dam on the Concord River. And <clears throat> uh, the, uh, uh, we were given space that we had for about 10 years and the people of uh, Bill Rick were great. They came out and they, they cleaned the place up. And uh, so I designed the exhibit. Uh, and it was an exhibit of my work, my illustrations, primarily. <laughs> and then we got some other things. We found there's some things in libraries and other areas uh, that uh, supplemented the, the exhibits. So we had a little museum going. And uh, uh, one of the members did some research on the extension of the canal into Boston. And if you, go, if you go to the Celtics game or uh, the, the Bruins, and uh, if you don't have a beer before you get to the bottom of the, the, the uh, Canal Street, ask somebody what the canal is of Canal Street. And there's a pub that says the Grand Canal, and it's the Grand Canal in Ireland. It has nothing to do with Boston. So in other words, nobody, not very many people know. And it turned out that uh, in, uh, just a few years after the, uh, uh, after the canal was finished, uh, the canal was so successful with bringing things down to Boston that they wanted to access the markets more readily. And there was a, there was a, uh, a mill pond in Boston, uh, and uh, Causeway Street was literally a causeway. And, and uh, all the things down to Haymarket Square and the, and the, the uh, 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 where, where the ships were, was water. And uh, so uh, what Bullfinch did, the designer of the uh, State House, uh, he was on the, on the town council, and uh, uh, they asked him what he might do to it. So he designed what is now called the Bullfinch Triangle. Uh, the top part of it is the, uh, um, uh, the causeway, <coughs> Causeway Street. He straightened it out. And then it was a, a genuine hard a triangle, and right down the middle of it, he put a canal, and that's what this canal is. And uh, so, this is Charlestown up here, and there's you can see a wiggly line here, which is uh, northern Massachusetts, and that is the canal. And then it comes down out of the uh, out into Charles River. The boats came across Charles River, and then it came down the canal. They were uh, the materials were dropped off the boats. In, for warehouses uh, where they distributed uh, to markets of different kinds, went all the way down to Faneuil Hall, which is there and was improved by Charles Bullfinch. They put a separate, mm -hmm. another uh, 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 layer on it. And, uh, uh, but the prime, the prime um, product 
that came down the canal was uh, 70 foot long logs. And they came all the way down here and they were driven into the muck at the bottom of the, the harbor and in, in uh, things that looked like palisades or, or, or walls. And then they were filled in and they created wharfs. And in a system called wharfing out, those wharfs were put side by side with space in between, another wall of uh, 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 piles would be put in, and then uh, I think it's happening over here, the lower section here. And then finally, uh, all of this, in fact, if you see, if you see uh, Faneuil Hall here, I don't know if you can see it on the <laughs> camera or not, uh, but right in front of it today is the Quincy Market. And it's not there in this painting because the land wasn't there yet. Wow. So that's how much land was created using these piles. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, anyway, I was asked to do this, and I was very pleased to do it. Uh, we have to talk to people who were building the building into it. And uh, they went along with it. Well, first of all, they had to, because the, this is Canal Street right here. And this is the canal. This, this, was, a, this was a creek that was widened. Uh, to allow the, uh, the canal was actually, uh, it, it had no locks. Uh, it was, uh, uh, went up and down with the, with the tide. <clears throat> uh, and uh, this is the first part that was filled in. This was filled in, uh, well, all of this was filled in by uh, 1840, uh, and the canal itself was uh, in 18, around 35 to 40, the railroads took all this, uh, well, pretty much killed it. and. Uh, <clears throat> but um, the importance of the canal from those, those years um, for Boston, remember that Boston uh, was uh, a wreck after the British left. I mean, they took it over and they lived there and uh, nothing was done. And when they left, uh, the, the, there was a dearth of imported uh, uh, clothing, uh, uh, fabrics, all sorts of things. And, uh, uh, in the early 19th century, we started making these things ourselves, or well, late 19th century, uh, uh, late 18th, mm -hmm. early 19th century. And a lot of the raw materials came down the canal. And uh, uh, furniture, mm -hmm. all, we have early furniture, but the finest furniture came from England. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the clothing, is, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, European clothing was most important. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we took over those things. Mm -hmm. and. Also, our raw materials were at a premium elsewhere in the world. And that's why the Boston got known as the hub. The hub. <laughs> so Thomas, let's, yeah. uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, did you join any uh, service organizations after uh, you left the service? Uh, I, I'm afraid to say I did and I didn't. Uh -huh. uh, my father was a member of the American Legion <clears throat> and uh, I joined when I got out. And, uh, uh, it turned out to be, uh, I mean, it, the American Legion, I, I can't default it because mm -hmm. it's done a lot of good. Uh, and what it does is put uh, many veterans in touch with the uh, veterans administrations. It paves the way for, for them to do a variety mm -hmm. of things. Uh, and uh, uh, it has a lot of services that are, are very worthwhile. Uh, but for me, I was going to Tufts and uh, uh, I went over to the clubhouse and there are a bunch of guys sitting down on the, uh, it's called the 5220 Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't stand it. Uh, they were just floating around, taking their $20 a week and drinking it up and uh, not getting a job, not doing anything for themselves. And uh, I didn't like the atmosphere. So I, I didn't, I was not involved with it. Mm -hmm. uh, now later, uh, uh, my, both my parents, my, my father was in, uh, the uh, head of the barracks, which is a, uh, veterans of the 17th uh, of the uh, First World War. And, uh, and then my mother was involved with the auxiliary and they made her the president once and the poor woman. I mean, she, that was not her thing. And uh, she was hamstrung when she went out. She had to give these uh, introductions to things. It was terrible. And uh, anyway, I used to go with them uh, to the meetings and things like that. And as a kid, I remember, uh, uh, going to the Christmas parties at the American Legion, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, 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 th they were fun. Uh, the uh, uh, Liberty Mutual put out a Christmas carol songbook, 
and they were distributed at these meetings and uh, uh, and this is uh, during the depression and all and uh, and I remember one man sat in what uh, in my childhood I thought was a throne uh, mm -hmm. it was a member of the Civil War part in the Civil War and he just stopped being there after a while mm -hmm. but uh, uh, and it seemed to me that there were a lot more people in the in the uh, um, and the organization at that time. <coughs> uh, but my father loved it, and uh, out of respect for him, I went to some of the meetings and things mm -hmm. like that. But then uh, what happened to me, um, I moved out to, I had a studio in Milton for a while, and I, I, my residence has always been, you know. By the way, uh, there was an attempt for the crew to meet after, uh, and about, about 15 years ago, and uh, I don't know why they did not contact me through the address I had when I was in the service, uh, because it, it's still my address. And, uh, but uh, I don't know if they had the meeting, or not. I hope they did. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I got a letter from <coughs> a fellow with my last name who lived down in Pennsylvania, and he said he got this request. And then he, and he was in the service still. And uh, so he sent, sent it to me, but it was 10 years after the meeting. Mm. And I, I felt terrible because, well, I would have gone. Mm. I mean, it would have been something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we, we were not, we were friendly, but we were not buddy-buddy. And, uh, and we knew something about girlfriends and uh, home life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is, the, the officers did. But, um, uh, and the enlisted men, I don't think we sat down with them too often. Mm -hmm. uh, but they seemed to get along well. Okay, before we uh, finish this up, I just yeah. wanted to ask whether any of your siblings also served during World War II? Yes, mm -hmm. my sister was in the waves. I went in and she said, ah, he's not gonna be alone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she went into the waves and uh, uh, she went down, uh, she served in the, the hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, I remember when I came home, I guess I, I was on my way to the South Pacific. I, uh, it, I remember now. And what I did was take a side trip down to Washington. And she came up to Washington. And uh, she, she, was, she had a room in a hotel. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, she got her key. And he said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm uh, going up to her room. And I said, and uh, he said, no, you're not. And I said, well, we're brother and sister, it's okay. He said, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we sat together and had, uh, so. but it was, it was a nice meeting. Mm -hmm. And she was in her uniform, I was in my uh, new uniform. And, uh, uh, and my brother, uh, Charlie, he just passed away last December. Uh, <clears throat> he might've been one of the last persons to uh, join the service. He went in the Navy mm -hmm. and uh, the war was already over. And I guess he had volunteered, and they took him. And he was in for six months. Uh, he was on a ship, and they went down to Cuba, and he got overseas pay, <laughs> and, and he was in for only six months, and he was out. And uh, uh, we used to kid him about it. But he had marvelous stories of action <laughs> that he told, but I never told my stories, <laughs> but he did, so that was fun. Yeah, and then my youngest brother, <clears throat> uh, during the Korean conflict, uh, and went into the CBs. And uh, he spent most of his time in North Africa and Italy, rather than, uh, he never went to the Orient. Mm -hmm. so, so, and <sighs> my niece, uh, I, I love her dearly, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why she did it, but she went up to the town hall and <clears throat> she finagled some people into identifying the corner that my house is at, as a Dayhill corner, and uh, it lists all the people who are in the service mm -hmm. with two flags together. The American Legion uh, take care of the flags. Nice. Yeah, so it's far more patri patriotism than <laughs> did exist. In, the, in fact, we were interviewed uh, for the local newspaper, and uh, uh, I, I had to say that patriotism is, isn't something that we, we carry on our sleeves, and. Uh, uh, like a lot of people, and uh, uh, we don't really understand that. And I said we, because, uh, and there's no question about it, my brother and sister were there. And uh, uh, so we, 
we, they didn't get the rara stuff. That made, I don't know whether they wanted that or not. But uh, in fact, reading the, the history of the 13th Air Force, um, it, it, was a, it was accurate, uh, very accurate in details, uh, but it was always a little bit rara. Mm -hmm. we, we took care of the enemy. We did this you know, and, and with a couple of uh, expletives. And, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I never. Uh, I never had any hatred for, I, I think I felt more hatred for the Germans than I did for the Japanese. And it's almost as if uh, uh, they, they, uh, they took it for a ride. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent, well, when I went over to Europe, <clears throat> I lived two and a half years in Rome, and I went up to Germany, and I had to fight that feeling. And I was a guest, uh, the, uh, um, Harry Rathbone, who was head of the uh, museum <coughs> in Boston, uh, uh, he was a very good friend of Max Beckmann, the, the painter. And uh, uh, when Beck, Beck, Max Beckmann came here, and he went to the Cincinnati Museum, I think. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. he, was, he was the artist in residence at one of those places. And uh, uh, <coughs> in, in Germany, and uh, I was. Uh, uh, Perry Rathbone um, went to the museum school and asked if any of the uh, members of the uh, uh, alumni were in Europe floating around. And he said there's a Max Beckmann Gesellschaft uh, uh, in, in uh, Murnau uh, in Bavaria. And uh, uh, he said, the, uh, uh, it, could you name somebody who we might invite? So next thing I know, I got this letter from my dear Mr. Dayhill. And it was from the Baron von Schnitzler. And, uh, and it was a very charming letter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went up there for a month. And uh, the Baron had been uh, in jail for three years or so because he was uh, head of a munitions factory. And that's what they did to him. And uh, he said, uh, and he made a comment once, and I figured that's it. We're not going to talk about any mm -hmm. of these things again. He said, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as armies of occupations go, uh, the Americans are pretty good. I said, oh, they come and go, huh? <laughs> so that was it. But he was a good host, and we, uh, I saw a lot of particularly uh, Rococo churches and things like that in Bavaria, and, and I saw uh, uh, Liechtenstein and a, a lot of the, the great, uh, uh, the crazy um, castles they had there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, that was unusual, and that one point, uh, and uh, I knew that we had soldiers uh, uh, all the way through the Bavarian area, and they had uh, special areas. And I'm not crazy about <coughs> Americans abroad when they do it uh, uh, relative to the Department of State, or I don't know about the Army, but, uh, and NATO. Uh, uh, I was in Naples, lived in Naples for six months, and uh, I went to the NATO beach once, and I was appalled by Americans who go abroad in a place like Italy that is so rich in culture and everything else, and they stay on the, on the compound, and they do all their buying in the PX, and they spend dollars, they never touch, well now it's a euro, uh, but they never touch the local currency. And I, I, what are they doing there? Mm -hmm. And I was staying with a, uh, I, I was teaching at the time in Naples. Uh, Tufts had a program and I, um, I taught a couple of courses for them. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I was living in a cul-de-sac uh, on, uh, up in the Bomero, which is an area that overlooks all of the, uh, uh, the Gulf of uh, uh, Naples. And um, there was an English couple living there, an English colonel and his wife and their uh, three children. And, uh, and that's how I got, he was a colonel in, the, in NATO. And they were living there uh, and uh, paying rent uh, with Lira and at the time. And uh, uh, they had Italian friends and, and uh, they said they couldn't understand the Americans either because they said there are plenty of places for them to live in right in the middle of the city and enjoy it. And instead, they stayed there. And uh, anyway, mm -hmm. and I had another brief, um, uh, I was down in South America once I love to drop place names. <laughs> uh, I was down in South America. In fact, I was, I was 
teaching at Emerson College and a student of mine said, why don't you drop by this summer? Uh, and I said, okay, where, where, where do you live? And he said, Venezuela. So I went down to Venezuela and it was an American and he was living in an oil, his father was working in an oil camp and they were inside a, a, a compound. And I have no comments about that but, uh, because this fellow actually had all the, the wives, the men are the ones who were working, the wives, he got them together and they put on uh, a musical. It was quite credible. And anyway, um, I, it, it, it was a long trip. I saw Machu Picchu uh, and other places, but uh, on the way back, uh, we had a, uh, as a strike on Pan American and we got uh, billeted in a, supposedly in a hotel uh, in Panama City. And uh, uh, I met a courier on the plane. He said, uh, uh, you don't want to go to a hotel. He said, uh, uh, we have a, an apartment uh, where couriers stay when they bounce off one place or another. I said, okay, I'll do that, it's more fun. And it was. And we went into Panama City and we saw some things. And then I got an idea of what, how it was like for Americans living in a compound uh, that literally they are second class citizens. They don't vote, they have no, no local politics, so they don't do that. They vote in national politics only. And so it, literally they're second class citizens. And their attitude toward the people they are close to, the people who lived in the area, the, the Panamanians, uh, were terrible. They looked down on them. Uh, and these people are not, the people who are on this, in this, uh, it was an army post, uh, but um, they're not necessarily well educated, uh, or uh, not that they have to be, uh, uh, but they look down on these people as ignorant and uh, uh, not capable of doing almost anything. And they use them as servants and that was it. And I got all of this from these, these people who were in this, uh, in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, apartment. Uh, but, uh, and, it, and, and of course we don't have that anymore. Uh, we're not down there. But uh, it seems to me that uh, we have a restricted approach. Even the, even the embassies are, are very closed. And I've known people who worked in embassies. And uh, uh, this is an attitude mm -hmm. that we're better than somebody else. And that's not good. OK, well, Thomas Dayhill, uh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and becoming part of the Native Veterans Oral History Project. It's my pleasure. Okay. <laughs>